right, here we go. We are on the air live right now. I hope you're pumped and I hope you're ready. We're going to go straight into the octagon. We're going to be doing that, the octagon of human history. And why is that? Because we're talking today about the introduction to the devout life right here at Paleocrat Diaries, the Friday, August 5th edition. Come on now. (laughs) I hope you are pumped up and ready to rock. I hope today's been good. I hope you're rocking out, loving family, loving life, even loving those enemies of yours, doing what you gotta do, trying to live the best you can, every thought, word, and deed dedicated to Christ the King. We do that here at Paleocrat Diaries with some simple resolves. We resolve deep down inside, super, super deep, to never give up, no matter what, to keep on smiling, and to remember that one day we're gonna die. And because we're gonna die, we've gotta dream bigger thoughts. This is what my daughter said. I live by it now. She's in heaven praying for me. So we gotta rock. We gotta do it. In fact, did you see it? Have you seen the awesome pictures, by the way, over at the Wolfpack? If you have not, it's because you're probably not there. And if you're not there, you're out of your mind. And you can make good on that and fix it and resolve that very, very deep-rooted problem by going to the description in the video below. We rock over there 24-7, super pumped up, right? Because we serve an amazing God and we live in terrible, terrible times. So we got to do better than just giggling at the enemy. We got to do better than that. We got to do better than just having good arguments that translate to the brain. I had an awesome conversation, won't say with who, but it was an awesome conversation today. Just getting right back down to that, that it's more than just a really good argument. It's it's better than a syllogism. It has to do with the heart. And it's difficult. It's not easy. You gotta confront your vices. And the way we're gonna do it today is we're gonna be talking about St. Francis. That's what we're gonna do. But before we do any of that, real quickly, if you have already seen The Saint Maker, uh, this promo, and if you know it by heart, that's the rule. (laughs) If you know it by heart, you've listened to the show so many times, that you're like, look, I already know it. I already know it. I know every single thing. I know every single line. You're like those really annoying people, right? Who they've seen the, uh, they've seen certain movies so many times that when you're watching it with them, they're saying the words the whole time. If that's you, when it comes to the Saint Maker, go get yourself some coffee or something. (laughs) Go get a beer, go get a pop, whatever you drink, you know, whatever it is, make sure even, even if it's water, Even if it's water, (laughs) tea, go get it right now because we're going to do this ad. And as soon as we come back, we're going to go right away, right into it with the introduction to the devout life. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in 90 seconds. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself, but in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction. And our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high-performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough, and most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion, because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca, and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcher. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life planner at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited though, so head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. Do that over at thesaintmaker.com slash paleocratdiaries. Oh, right away, I've got to deal with this right away let's get it right on the screen we're gonna do this this is this is to let you know what kind of show this is (laughs) yes here we go here we go we've got the chat real quick someone every once in a while we get someone who's never seen the show and they're they're tuned in 
And maybe they're expecting something with like kind of a really slow intro. A lot of Catholic shows have that. So it's a lot like classical or chant or something. Uh, it starts out that way. And th- they're, not, they're definitely not wearing the awesome glasses that I've got. Uh, so they're definitely not doing that. But the thing is, every once in a while, like through my career, I've been compared to a lot of different people throughout my whole life. And part of that's probably because I was raised in a radio home. My dad was a station manager. And so I grew up living in a radio station. I mean, that's, you know, so as a kid, uh, I remember, speaking of Rush, by the way, I remember Rush back on TV. You know what I mean? Like, I remember Rush before he lost all of his weight. And I remember being a kid, maybe eight years old, nine years old, looking up at a poster and thinking, that guy, man, he looks pretty cool. He's got a cigar, right? The smoke's all coming out. He has that neon uh, really cool signature that he had. And of course, his golden microphone. And But really, it was my dad. You know, it was one of those things that my dad was my hero. But I was, uh, you know, obviously into Rush Limbaugh. I grew up in that. Uh, but also, of course, people like Michael Savage, even Alex Jones, and of course, myself. I doing my own show, my own stuff for a long time and did radio most of most of my life. So came to YouTube. It is a little bit different because right now I'm talking into a camera, right? <laughs> I've got I'm, I'm in a room. I've got lights all over. I don't know if you could see it. Check it out. Check it out. So right there is a huge umbrella light. Over there is my key light. So that's my fill light. That's my key light. I've got behind me here motivated lighting. And I've got over here three different lights. So I've got I went to school for media and stuff. And so I've I've studied television, social media, radio for a very long time. Um, but I've had people call me Rush Limbaugh. Who what, what what was it recently? Oh, Kanye. Kanye West. They were like, oh, this guy's a, this guy's a white wannabe Kanye. <laughs> Are you serious? Are you serious? Oh yeah, Kanye. He's doing he's doing deep dives into introduction to the devout life. He's doing deep dives into Saint Irenaeus and the hypothesis canon system complex of apologetics. <laughs> so if you like to to learn deep things, this is just this is this is for for a person in the chat. If you would like to learn some deep stuff, right, and have fun while you do it, you're in the right place. If, however, and look, different strokes, different folks, different strokes, different folks. You might even be gone by this point, not sure. But the thing is, if, however, you are into the more laid back, serious, somewhat boring styled commentary that is a guy staring at a screen and very calmly talking for an hour, then you are definitely at the wrong place. (laughs) It is at the wrong place. You know, you just gotta say, look, you got, dance with who you brought. So you waited a while, it is a bummer, yeah. So yeah, it's okay. Yeah, good evening. Ivan says, first time here, uh, first time there, in fact, I didn't understand until now. (laughs) I thought I've seen you before, Ivan. Are you tricking me, homie? (laughs) Have you been here before for real? No, but this is, so in in reality, I get flack, by the way, for doing intros like that last a while and kind of, you know, jiving with the folks, mixing it up with the, with the individuals. We, we go through books. So that's what we do. I, I don't, I don't do the, I'm an Oracle, listen to everything I come out with in the moment thing. Um, it's, that's just not the way I roll. And every book that we go through is a book that I've read numerous times, three, upward, four or five times in my life, studied it and said, you know, there's stories to go along with it. There's ideas and it's all open. Of course, it begins saying, this is my, my opinion. It's an opinion show. And so, but it's my best opinion, best foot forward, right? So we've gone through so far, we've done numerous books, okay? We've gone through chapter by chapter analysis of Enthusiasm by Ronald Knox. It's like an 800 page tome, right? It's his magnum opus of his life. So Monsignor Ronald Knox, we went through How Not to Be Secular by the philosopher uh, James K.A. Smith. It's a reading of philosopher, Catholic philosopher Charles Taylor, his book Secular Age. So we went through that. We went through Lassance, Father Lassance. He has a manual for boys and for girls, and we applied that to people older. It didn't matter. On top of that, we St. Irenaeus, we went through the neo-patristic uh, presuppositionalism. Uh, so I did that, went through numerous chapters, not the entire book, but numerous chapters uh, in an apologetic dealing with us, particularly with like Protestants, Orthodox, that kind of stuff, um, and set of a contism, having to do with... Um, uh, Catholic Controversy by Francis de Sales. So we went through that. And then and then I think three quarters of the book on nihilism, 
We went through uh, Christianity in Crisis, almost the entire thing by Hank Hanengraff, as well as numerous chapters from different books like Kingdom of the Cults, as well as the book um, Mystics and Messiahs. Okay, so all in all, if you've been along for the ride, you've actually gone through a bunch of books, like a lot. And so, and it's a deep dive into these things. It's not a little itsy bit. You're going to come out with, with uh, a grab bag of knowledge. That's <laughs> what you're going to do. So, all right, really grateful to all of you, all of you who were in here. And yeah, yeah, given no, Rush was a barren man. <laughs> yeah, by the way, uh, we have Kaiser Kids 7 coming up, right? We just found out recently. So uh, thank you for the, uh, all the, the kind wishes and things like that. So definitely, just got into the show recently as a new Catholic. It helps a lot. Very grateful for that, Cormac. And, you know, reach out to me anytime. Um, if it's a Christian show, why not read the Bible? Um, because the Bible is part of a corpus, right? An entire canon complex within the church, okay? So we don't believe in sola scriptura, for example. We, my whole series, by the way, on Protestant stuff was just, just drenched with scripture, so, and particularly the invincible argument against the various heresies and bogus ecclesiologies of Protestants found in St. Matthew 18. And so, the, the, St. Francis de Sales calls it the invincible argument. All of these things, you won't find anything that I've said that would be contrary to uh, scripture read within the bosom of the church. And that's actually a wide, a wide spectrum of different positions, different takes over time that people have had. But to read it within the bosom of the church, will I? Will there be things that I say that are contradictory to Joe Schmo, Protestant guy somewhere? I'm sure, um, but that doesn't really that doesn't phase me at all. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, I made comments to the ecumenical councils, wonderful works before, but first time I'm live here. You, you know what? Yeah, and that's the other thing with Paleocrat Diaries. It's it's me uh, making shows. It's me and Jake Fowler. Jake Fowler just wrapped up a series that was awesome. If you want to know more about ecumenical councils, he's your guy. He's a, he's a teacher, uh, and he's a teacher at heart, right? And his mind, a brilliant mind. And so just a, a super genius dude. Um, and so that's one of those things. And yeah, by the way, just one more thing about the why not read the Bible. It's one of those things, I think, where, you know, it's, I used to say it this way. Because right? I actually have a problem with like professional Catholics, if that makes sense. You know, um, so I used to say I am a Catholic who has a show and I talk oftentimes about Catholic issues. I used to talk about politics, religion and culture as well. But I'm a Catholic guy. So I don't divorce my faith. I don't hang my, my faith up at the door when I approach a microphone. At the same time, it wasn't so central to what I talk about now. But I, I came to the conclusion that a lot of talk radio and TV news and stuff like that is poo-poo trash nonsense. That's a very, um, it's a very scholarly def, uh, term. <laughs> so poo-poo trash nonsense, okay? Um, because all it is, is it's knee-jerk reaction stuff. They go and they find the news of the day. They find stuff that's controversial. They respond to it without doing much study. It's all just like winging it in the moment. And they're finding stuff that's the most sensational, scandalous stuff in the universe. And that's what, that's what sells. And that's not helping. In fact, if, if Betty Crocker had a recipe for disaster and cold war, uh, cold civil war in the United States, um, yeah, that would be it. So if you want to have balkanization of your civilization and LARP for the rest of your life trying to get back to something that you ain't getting back to, Stick with talk radio. That's <laughs> what, what you're going to get. It's, it's entertainment. Not much enlightenment, to be quite frank. Not many people. How many times do they go through deep dive into any kind of books at all? It's really not that deep. I think it's one of the reasons why people generally gravitate toward it. I don't mean to be too disrespectful, but I think that's true. And so, yeah, we'll see. So anyway, very grateful for all of you. Make sure if you would like to reach out to me in particular... If you have a question specifically for me, make sure, or a comment, make sure to put at the meaning of Catholic, that little at symbol, the meaning of Catholic. That way it will pop up on the screen. It will be bright orange. I will see it very clearly. Otherwise, it's just going to be in this blur of a bunch of squigglies <laughs> on the screen. Yeah. So, all right. So, all right, let's get back to this thing here. And sorry for that long intro. I feel badly because I've been trying to do a lot better with that. But every once in a while, man... 
every once in a while, people get under my craw. <laughs> and, and people, people changing, people changing the 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 goalposts. Well, is this just Rush Limbaugh? Oh, it's a Christian show. Why don't you just do this? I don't know if I could actually appease a person like that. What do you say to people who say all you need to know about the faith is in the Bible? I say those people don't even know where the Bible came from. I have an entire episode, I have episodes, plural, on that. Th those individuals, they take for granted something that was given to them by the wonderful, gracious hand of the Roman Catholic Church, and that's the canon of Scripture. Before that, you had multiple different canons. That's all you had. Plus, let's be frank, I don't think anybody with a straight face without clown makeup on can possibly say that when you can go online and look up churches in your own town and probably have 500. I mean, uh, it's like, it's like, well, the Bible clearly states what you need. So yes, even if it's entirely within scripture, even if you say that everything within that deposit can be drawn out and extrapolated and, and developed from that, fine. But the problem is how can people say that? Cause I, you know, I don't know where you stand on stuff, but I know a lot of people who, who say that sort of thing and they, they believe beliefs that hardly any Protestant believes. And then another Protestant says it, and they believe stuff that Protestants don't, other Protestants don't believe. And you can just go down to the smorgasbord of crazy. It's, it's complete disunity. The idea that there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, that's fake. The Protestants don't have that. And plus, the idea of if, if we based everything we did just out of Scripture, you would never have Scripture alone. Because you won't find anywhere in Scripture that states, Go to scripture for every single belief about faith and practice. <laughs> in fact, you have multiple verses that talk about tradition outside of what was written in the letters. So yeah, that's, that's a little bit of the low hanging fruit, but it's stuff that we've talked about. So we address these sorts of things, right? And yeah, we're not, we're not playing around. We're doing a good job. I'm glad you're here, by the way, regardless of any disagreements, regardless of any disagreements, very, very glad to have you along. Same thing with Light of Christ Press, driving home listening. Very, very glad for that. All right. So we talked last time. We talked last time about the um, the purpose of this, right? We gave a, a brief a brief introduction to DeSales himself. Like, who is he? What's this all about? The idea, the excellence of devotion. What is true devotion? What is the devout life in and of itself? We talked about how to harness those things and, and why in season and out of season is okay. And we're going to go a little bit deeper into that today, okay? And so we've got this right here, chapter one. This is part part third. This is how you know you're, you're doing pretty good. You're going back into a good time. Part third, chapter one. Rules for the practice of virtue, the selection of virtues to be practiced. Right away, right out of the gate, you're pretty pumped up because you say, okay, well, what do you mean by selection of virtues to be practiced? I mean, wouldn't it just be all of them? The queen bee never settles in a hive without being surrounded by her swarm. And charity never takes possession of a heart without bringing inner train all other virtues, exercising and bringing them into play as a general his troops. But she does not call them forth suddenly, all at once, nor in all times and places. The good man is like a tree planted by the waterside, that will bring forth its fruit in due season. Because when a soul is watered by charity, it brings forth good works seasonably and with discretion. It's one of those things where, I, and I love this, in part one, remember, the last episode, he began by talking about the flowers. In this one, he's using bees. I love that he brings these kinds of elements in and it, the visuals that it has. And the way that it's affected by our, our connection to and appreciation of beauty, nature, productivity. And in this case, patience, discretion. And so he's saying, you have charity. Charity is going to bring with it all the others. But you have to treat it like the queen bee. There will be times, and he'll go into this, there will be times where certain virtues are more going, they will be emphasized greater than at other times. Just because the times themselves may afford better opportunity for the exercise of one virtue over another. So he says, don't worry about it. And this, it should be a relief. He's, he's generous through and through, gracious through and through. He was, in fact, mentioned numerous times in Ronald Knox in the book Enthusiasm. Throughout that whole series, there's a quote by him 
about spreading the net wide, not just to get the big fish, but to get to get even you know the little ones to, to spread it all out, get it real wide. The people that may not be the best fish in the world to get them in that net to draw them in, to help them, to lift them up, and so it wouldn't be so exclusive of a club, which of course is what happened with Jansenist and the like. That's when uh, Knox was was uh, known to be referencing the great saint here, Saint Francis de Sales, uh, during that specific chapter. That music, which in gladness rejoices our hearts, is an intrusion into the time of heaviness. There are some who make a great mistake in striving after some special virtue by acting upon it at unsuitable times. They are like those philosophers of old who insisted on always laughing or always crying. And what is worse, such persons find fault with those who differ from them. But the apostle bids us weep with them that weep. And rejoice with them that rejoice. And charity is patient, benevolent, liberal, prudent, and kind. It's one of these things, right? These unsuitable times. It was a criticism. Do you remember a criticism a while back when people said, you have the phrase, keep on smiling. And and the person was real scumbag (laughs) and said something like, oh, do you mean like if like somebody is dying or like raped or something that you're like, (laughs) no. Obviously not. That's sick. That's like messed up. You, there's a time for laughter. There's a time for joy. There's a time for all these things. What do we say? Joy comes in the morning. All right? The idea is similar to never give up. It's more of a heart disposition. So you have one that's a resolve of the will and one of them that's a general disposition of joy that even in your sadness, you will never come face first, right? Running into a brick wall, of despair, that you will not give up hope and that that hope and those silver linings can allow a twinkle in your eye and maybe a smile to perk on your face, even in the sadness. Otherwise, you're going to be a wreck. You're going to be a wreck. But but unsuitable times. So there, there are times then that are better suited to different virtues. And he talks about those who say you always got to be sad or you always got to be mad. You always got to be, you know, or, or always laughing. Ha 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 ha. There's a time for that. All right, we have a good time in the beginning. We tell some jokes. It's interspersed throughout, I've got to say. At the same time, there's a seriousness to the show. Also, how many times have, have there been tears on the show talking about tragedy, talking about the life and death of my daughter with childhood cancer? People have cried. We cry together too, but we still call ourselves glad trads because there's no, there's no despair in that. That's a sickness that leads to death. But there are some virtues of universal application and which should infuse their own spirit into everything. We have but rarely opportunities for the practice of courage, magnanimity, and great sacrifices. But every action of our daily life should be influenced by gentleness, temperance, humility, and purity. Some qualities may be more eminent, but these are the most needful. So I was going to use today, I was going to use a a picture of uh, my wife. It was during the, the final days of my daughter's life. And she was really tired and she would lay down and she was a go-getter, you know, when, before the end, you know, that last couple weeks. She was a go-getter, up and about, going to therapy, doing her thing, striving hard to get back on roller skates, which she did, resolving to never give up, to keep on smiling, to know that she has a limited time, so dream bigger thoughts, give it all you got. That's, what she, that's how she lived, okay? She went to school, even when she wasn't feeling that great. She did those sorts of things, showing bravery, right? She was honorable. In all things. But there were times that were particularly sad. Times where, you know, it wasn't just simply the bravery that's like, I've got this. There were times that would, would conversations that I don't want to die. I prefer not to. And I, I'm scared of the pain. I don't know what's coming. The conversations that come from that, you can't even imagine. And I pray that you never have to. But those are times where this picture, she was sleeping 
And she, she'd been sleeping like 18 hours to 20 hours a day for three days. We knew that it was coming to an end. And she's sitting there and it was 4th of July. I'll never forget. And those fireworks cause a serious problem for people with hypothalamic storms. But there's fireworks all over the place. And a lot of patriotic people here. And they're all doing their thing. And that night, Samantha, she could barely wake up. And my wife, she got on her knees and she's just stroking her hair as she's sleeping. All groggy and such. And she's just stroking her hair. And my wife, her face in that moment, there was so much hurt and so much care. And yet, and yet, there was gentleness, humility. There was purity in that moment. She was a mother. She could be, she was sad, devastated inside, but yet inspired and loving, right? Inspired by this little girl, inspired by the things that she'd seen the family do. And in that moment, there was tremendous sacrifice just to kneel by her side with no responses back and to play with her hair. Sugar is more agreeable than salt. But salt is in much more universal uh, requisite, requisition. Therefore, we should be rich in these everyday virtues of which we stand in perpetual need. We ought always to give preference to those virtues which are most incumbent on us and not to those which are most agreeable to our inclinations. Do you ever have a deal with that? Where if you, and maybe I hope that we see because this is not judgmental of anybody. This is this is a book that has torn me right, right down to the bone and marrow. It's true. It's cut to my heart. It's cut to the chase. It's run vices out of town. It's revealed the monsters within, and in, in my own life. And that's why I'm so delighted, in fact, to be talking about this particular book because of the role it's played even more than the ones on Father Lassance and the manuals for young men and women. But in there, one of the things that I found, and especially when I was really critical of the church all the time, and I was like being really just, just angry about it. One of the things that I noticed was that a lot of the things I was critical of were my own sort of enthusiasms. They were my own disciplines, my own mortifications. And those things were fueled by my own inclinations, not by any sort of guide, not by any sort of method. There was nothing like that. I was winging it. <laughs> I was winging it. I remember using the discipline, right? The rope. I used that without guidance. And I remember I told, I told the priest about it and, he's, and he was shocked. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just disciplining it up. <laughs> I, I don't know. He's like, um, well, how long have you been doing that? Because I was afraid because I, I didn't know. I mean, there was knots in it and stuff. And hitting, I would hit hard. I had no, no sense of how frequently, how often. I had no guidance at all, whether or not that was even a good idea. I just said, well, people did it before. People, did, people just did it. Therefore, that's good enough for me. And it led to some really embarrassing things, like going to the, the VA, and they're taking off the shirt to check my heart rate and stuff, and I got bruises on my body. And they're like, what is, what's that? Oh, I'm just disciplining it up. Are you talking to anybody about that? Nah. <laughs> I don't feel like I really got to do that. Yeah. Or, or the embarrassing thing of being with other guys that you kind of convinced to fall into these inclinations that you've got, these enthusiasms you have. I was sitting there with two dudes. We're sitting there praying a rosary, lashing, blam, blam, blam. This is years ago. We're talking like 2008, 2007, something like that. Sitting there just wham, wham, wham praying in the house and my boy's uh, uh, mom rolls up. I mean, we were like family. He's my best friend. He passed away too. We pray for the repose of his soul. His uh, patron saint was St. Ignatius of Antioch. But the thing is, his mom, she just rolls right up in there. <laughs> we had candles going, chant going, and we're sitting there just wham, wham. And she looks at us and we're like deer in headlights. It was terrible. Scandalous even. No direction, none, but it was according to an inclination, my own personal, and it caused havoc for myself and for others. St. Paul is one that is mentioned in the book. Right? 
And you've got this, this uh, St. Paul, it took delight in the practice of bodily mortification. Okay, so there's been others, thereby enhancing her spiritual consolations. But obedience to her superior was a higher duty. And therefore, St. Jerome allows that she was wrong in fasting immoderately, contrary to the direction of her bishop. The apostles too. All right? He says that they were commissioned to preach and that they rightly judged that they must not forsake that responsibility in order to minister to the bodily needs of the poor, even though that in and of itself is a good thing. There's priority. What's your calling? What's your vocation? What are you doing with your life? What do you need to do that would be most beneficial? And, and are you in any way connected with your superior? Every station in life imposes some peculiar obligation. Different virtues are incumbent upon a bishop. We talk about this. We talk about the responsibilities of a bishop to know your pay grade to know your place within the divine constitution of the church, which no man can change. And yet there's this leveling going on, right? You have a leveling of, of people trying to, to drag the, the priests and the bishops down to their level. And on the other side, you have those who take upon themselves the responsibilities uh, traditionally and essentially belonging to those who are their superiors. In both of those cases, pride. It's different for a prince, for a soldier. A wife has her duties as well, and the widow hers. And although all should practice every virtue, still each should seek chiefly to advance in those uh, peculiar ones, right? That are peculiar, <laughs> peculiarly required. It's a weird word for me. That are more particular to their station in life. By the state of life, to which God has called him, and I'll add, or her. So the idea being, what are you called to do? And that doesn't that give a, a sense of priority too, that you need to know what, you, what you're, you're doing with your life, right? What your station is. You should be discerning, right? When you're younger and, and working, with, working with priests, connecting with, with sisters and nuns, connecting with them, right? And saying, help me to know, I want to pray about this. I, I, I want to know what am I called to? And not just a job, right? But then once you do have a job, there's going to be certain things that you're, you're going to be called upon in general and specific as well. And we'll cover this in a second. But in general, that are more uh, applicable, right? And incumbent upon you given what you do. I've learned this recently. I've learned it by saying, man, there are things that I've got to do. I've got to do these things because my job is this apostolate and more important, being a dad, being a husband. And these things together, there's different things that I've got to do with the business here than with my business in the house. But both of those, there's, there's a balance of these things that says, I am, I am called to be with my family. I'm called to raise them in the fear of the Lord. I'm called to love my wife and to live and to sacrifice for her in the way that our Lord did for his bride, the church. And at the same time, part of that is doing the work that you were sent to do. But you have to discern that. Amongst those virtues not especially involved by our position, we should cultivate the most excellent rather than the most showy. Some virtues which approach uh, our senses and are, so to say, material and are therefore highly esteemed and preferred by ordinary men who thus will exalt temporal almsgiving above spiritual or fasting, discipline, and bodily mortifications above gentleness, cheerfulness, modesty, and other acts of discipline of the heart, which are in truth greatly preferable. That's something that in this modern day and age is particularly bad. Particularly bad. You know, because we live in a day and age of show business. TV is dominated, the visual medium, cinema, 
right? Making its way to television inside of people's homes, making it way, making its way to, to apps and ways on your smartphones where now you can just watch videos, including this one, including this one. And that's why when I, when, when I left Holy Faith Media and I took those months off, I had to really settle on some things and I had to prioritize and say, how do we make it so that those things that are showy, that are there just for the, the, the glitz and the, and the glitter and the glamour and all that stuff, how do we make it so that we don't fall prey to that? Because the medium itself is prone to it. And so are we. We're all prone. That's why, that's why we take the best angle shot of ourselves. Or we want to crop pictures that don't look so good down below, you know, down below the chest kind of profile area. <laughs> right? We go, oh, yeah, don't show that. Don't show that. that. was a video recently, man. I was looking not too hot recently in a video. And I'm like, man, son. You got to keep doing that fat shame to fitness. You're not, you know, you got a ways to go, dude. (laughs) You got a way to go. But how do we do that? And one of those things that I said is, I'm going to follow books. I'm not going to wing it. I'm not going to try. You know, does anyone think that doing what we're doing here is going to make you go viral? This is a mom and pop shop. That's what this is. This is not you know, popular entertainment. It's fun. It's entertaining. But people are like, dude's going through a book about virtue written by a guy who lived in from between 1567 and 1622. (laughs) Old school with weird words on the cover. You know, what's this all about? But that's one of those checks and balances that said, these are things and focusing on community Instead of fans, friends. I remember saying that early on, saying, look, I don't want just a bunch of fans. It's nice to get likes. It does, it is kind of poo-poo trash that we don't get even more. I think it's I think it's a good show. However, and the topics are urgent. The content is, in fact. And we have a community of people. And in that community, you got to deal with the rough and tumble. You have to deal with humility. You have to deal with patience. You have to deal with different things in your life that that are not so difficult to deal with when you're riding high. When you're somebody who's like, you know, stardom is your thing. And at the center of it, a prayer chain. A prayer chain where every single day people are praying for the intentions of those individuals who from this show and this apostolate bring their prayers. Checks and balances. Good ones, by the way gentleness, cheerfulness, take heart, glad trans. <laughs> take heart, modesty, other acts of discipline of the heart because they're preferable. Seek the highest virtues, not the most lauded, the best, not the most obvious, the truest, and not the most showy. It's a good practice to select some particular virtue at which to aim, not neglecting the others, but in order to give regularity and method to the mind. So you had, he gives examples of this, right? He gives examples. Some of those would be, for example, King St. Louis. King St. Louis is one regularly visited his hospitals and he ministered with his own hands to the sick. A king, bringing himself down in a humble place. There was another, not a king, king of comedy in my opinion, Right, Chris Farley. Chris Farley, funny guy, sad, tragic story. Right, what happened in his life? He had he he was struggling with his own demons, but he was also a person who attended mass every day. He'd go in the morning, right, and he would work uh, every week. He'd, he'd be seen by people in New York, sitting there and seeing him go and feed the poor in a local parish. He would do those sorts of things. He didn't have to. He had gobs of money. He could be out on his yacht all the time, not caring about the average folks, not caring about the Johnny Q and Sally Sue, people like me and people like you. He didn't have to, but he did. And he found himself drawn to them, feeding them, caring for them. And not not to the praise and recognition of his, of his co-workers on Saturday Night Live. It was personal. 
Another one would be St. Francis, loved poverty above all things, called poverty his bride. St. Gregory the Great took great delight in welcoming pilgrims. Tobias adopted a charitable habit of burying the dead. St. Elizabeth loved to set aside her royal independence by entirely subjecting herself and her whole will to God. St. Catherine became a widow. She devoted herself to serving in the hospital. Cassian relates how a certain devout woman desiring to practice the virtue of patience had recourse to St. Athanasius, who assigned to her as a companion a poor widow of a fretful, irritable, passionate temper. <laughs> what a terrible thing. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like, I mean, just the string of words there, it's like it gets worse. You're like, ah, what? Can you imagine? I can. I've known some people. I've known all different kinds. You go to St. Athanasius, right? You go to St. Athanasius. And you say, well, uh, I'm going to assign you a companion. Oh, cool. Excellent. That's wonderful. Who is it? Oh, it's this person. Dang, son. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. You misunderstood what I meant. (laughs) I meant like a pen pal. I did not mean somebody up in my house. A fretful, irritable, passionate temper. (laughs) This is gross. Who, tendering herself almost insupportable to the pious maiden, afforded her ample scope for the practice of forbearance and gentleness. The story actually hits home to me. I wish that I had read this before many of the experiences I had in my life. One person. And if you've got any stories, tell them here or after the show. We have a, right as soon as the show is over, we've got a a live chat. It won't be very long. I want to spend some time with the kiddos, right? They lay down and they watch movies until they go to bed. It's at the end of the, end of the summer break anyway. So it's going to be changing. But I had, I had a, I went to this school, right? Um, Christ for the Nations. It was in a little town right outside of Vancouver, Canada. And the people there, when I applied, they already knew my sister. My sister was going there. I was in Dallas before that at the, the main campus. And so I go up to Canada and they said, they, they sat me down. The president of the school sits me down and he goes, look, um, We know that you grew up in a home with a brother who had very severe special needs, okay? And so very severe. And my brother had a close head injury when he was six years old. And so we've talked about him here before. And so I grew up in that environment. We had nurses 24 hours for many, many, many years. My brother had a trach, all sorts of things. So he said, we have somebody here who that person is... uh, uh, has special needs. And is it okay if we place him with you? Now, the dorms were actually apartments. So these apartments had two rooms. You had two guys in one room, two guys in the other, you had bunk beds. So I was going to be with this guy. This guy, there were certain very quirky things. And we're talking very quirky. Things that were obviously... multifaceted. I don't want to throw the guy under the bus, but he made a promise when he was like 10 to stay 10 forever. And it affected him even physically. And it was bizarre. Baths, you know, asking people, RAs to help him in the bath, help him to, he had to help with deodorant and stuff. But yet at the same time, he was otherwise fully functional. So there was obviously disability going on there. (laughs) There's obviously these things. I did not treat that with gentleness. I wanted, it was, it was tough. It was really, really tough. Forbearance? No way. I wanted just nothing to do with the guy. I was mad that they put me with him. I didn't view that as an opportunity. That's changed. In fact, anyone who knows about my chat over on Telegram, anybody who knows, the link's in the description below. You have seen the forbearance. (laughs) You have seen the kind of crazy that stumbles on in and you're like, wow, who's this? Who's this cat? And you deal with that. It's an encounter and it's hot. It's like lava. 
being shoved in your eyeballs. <laughs> and you got to deal with it. But I say patience. I have people begging me, even admins, begging me, please make some rule. Even if they didn't say anything, even if they didn't say anything, it's just that they haven't said it yet. We got to get them out. And I say, no, no. Because we go to the margins here. We're going to the Johnny Q and Sally Sue. Do you know what kind of crazy... (laughs) <laughs> you're going to deal with just dealing with ordinary folks. Holy cow. Holy cow. It's off the charts. And so you're going to deal with extreme stuff, extreme positions, especially, I don't know, over on Telegram. And yet, and yet, what do we do? We're field hospital. We're not here for the giggles to just make fun of cuckoo crazies. Yes, cuckoo crazy nonsense. Totally true. That's true. On the other hand, reaching down, pulling them up, recognizing any kind of growth at all, and gritting the teeth and saying, gentleness, forbearance, you can do it. God's not asking you to do what you can't do with the help of his grace. Find those things as opportunities. Some have devoted themselves to tending the sick, some to visiting the poor. The advancement of Christ's religion amongst little children. The restoration of lost and wandering souls. There we go. There we go. The especial care of church and altars. Others to the promotion of peace and concord amongst men. Thereby producing all manner of beautiful flowers. For these pious souls who adopt some a special practice of devotion. Use it as the groundwork whereon they embroider countless other virtues, thus regulating and giving method to all their good works and affections by means of this their chief object and arraying their soul in a vestiture of gold. A vesture. In a vesture of gold wrought about with diverse colors. It gives you a groundwork. Do you know how many virtues I've been able to practice (laughs) since picking up this show? Do you know how many virtues are being fleshed out right now inside of this chat? (laughs) Yeah. You know how many? A lot of them. And yet, we treat that almost like, do you wonder sometimes if like deep down inside our actions betray this notion Right, that we we kind of entertain this idea that maybe God doesn't know what's going on, or He just simply can't help it. That he's up, He's up in heaven, biting nails. Oh no, I can't believe it! I didn't know this was going to be so tough on Jeremiah. Oh no, what's He going to do? Do we believe that, or do we believe that He's sovereign? Do we believe in in, in trust, in fact, in His providence? Otherwise, why would it make sense? to do an act of resina- resignation to his providence, to the divine will. Why, why would that even make sense? What would be the point of, of bearing your cross every day? In other words, he's saying it's coming. If they hated him, they're going to hate you. And you make mistakes, unlike our Lord. You're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes. There's temporal things that are going to come on us. And some of those things, maybe, maybe it's two birds with one stone. Right? Maybe this fretful, irritable, passionate, tempered woman, <laughs> this woman, you're like, oh, it's like nails on a chalkboard every day. Maybe that was also one of those things. Well, you kind of got what you had coming, but it's also a really good opportunity <laughs> or it's a good opportunity, but it also might kind of be a little bit of penance, right? A little bit of the stuff that you got to deal with in time and space, for the junk that you did. It's okay. It's okay. If we are hindered by some particular vice, we should as far as possible strive to cultivate the opposite virtue, making all things tend to it. I love that. But do you know your particular vices? 
Do you think you could at accurately describe them? Diagnose it, self-diagnose? Would it be something maybe your confessor might know a little bit more? Your spiritual director, a little bit more. And if you don't have one, as a reminder, pray for one. Search one out. And, and listen to the admonitions from DeSales at the end of the last program, the previous one. But when you find this and you see what the problem is, he says, cultivate the opposite of that. What a genius idea, by the way. <laughs> what a genius idea. And you're like, first things first, this one's the worst. First things first, deal with the worst. And that way, you're dealing with it in the best way. Like, for example, uh, the idea of going on the tallest and fastest roller coaster first, and then you'll be not, it won't be so crazy and difficult to be doing other ones later. You got to deal with it. Face the fear. Look into the abyss known as your own sin and confront it and say, look, I see what it is. It's wicked bad. It's tearing away at me. And I need to do better. How do I do better? Cultivate the opposite. Press the antithesis. If I'm especially tempted with pride or anger, I must, above all things, seek to practice humility and gentleness and call in all my other devout acts of prayer, the sacraments, prudence, perseverance, and temperance to my aid. For even as the wild boar wets his tusks right, to help out his other teeth with the help of his other teeth, thereby sharpening them also, so the good man, who seeks to perfect himself in that virtue of which he stands most in need should wet and sharpen it by the practice of other virtues, which will thus themselves become stronger and brighter. Yeah. Megado. <laughs> and you could apply that, of course. You could apply that by, by even saying wolf pack. Just as the wolves. Right? But just as the boar, probably a better example. But either way, you cut that to say multiple things are coming in play, but those things are coming in through prayer. Your main focus is the guide, the foundation, that primary one. You say, I've got to go after that. And that's an emphasis. But the rest of the team is here. The whole gang is here. Me and the boys have rolled up. That's what that virtue is going to say. Me and the boys, we're in town. <laughs> and so, But you've got, you've got your bows. You got the boss at the head. St. Augustine says, well, that when men are beginning to lead a devout life, they commit errors which are, strictly speaking, against the laws of perfection, but which nevertheless are valuable as indications of future piety, to which they often conduce not a little. The low groveling fear whence arises over scrupulousness in the minds of those who are but just forsaking sin is a quality not to be despised. That's strange. So if you're just starting to overcome a particular sin and you find yourself over scrupulous, St. Augustine and St. Francis de Sales say, that's okay. It's actually good. <laughs> that's good because you are, you are enslaved. You're in chains and you're going back to the trough. You're putting your hands willfully back into those chains. Really? Be a little over scrupulous about that. That's okay. He said it's a quality not to be despised inasmuch it is, it is the forerunner of future purity of conscience. But, it's a big old but, a big old but in here. The same feeling would be blamable in those further advanced in holiness whose hearts should be filled with love which will gradually banish such servile fear. So if you're advanced in this, and you're still doing that, you got yourself a problem. You got yourself a problem. But if you're a noob, if you're a noob to the game and you, you have been in chain for a long time, willfully so, over there getting lashed, hands up, right? And, ah, and you're like, oh, dude, bro, get out of there. And you're like, I put myself here. <laughs> what? what? Ah, and you're like, okay, that's sick, dude. 
that's sick. And they're like, and once they catch that and they realize, oh my gosh, that's really messed up. It's totally sick that I'm going in and I'm doing that whole Kunta Kinte thing, but willingly, right? And, and not feeling too badly about it. For them to feel badly and maybe even over scrupulous, that's okay, but not for long. That has to be part of a process. And that process has to be one that is leading to perfection, to true devotion, and not servile fear. He uses an example of this. Yeah. Originally, St. Bernard was exceedingly severe and rigorous toward those whom he directed, telling them when they came to him to leave their bodies and come with the spirit only. Hearing their confession, he treated all, even the least fault, with such severity. And he so pressed his poor novices in perfection that instead of urging them forward, he kept them back. For they were dismayed and discouraged at being thus rudely driven up so steep and rugged a path. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that way talking to other people? and that you do that maybe of others, that you expect more, that you expect perfection, that you don't recognize the, the amazing steps in the right direction. I'm, I'm more bummed out by people who are further along in the path, walking away and finding themselves further and further than I am of the person who began further and further away really far, right? <laughs> He's way out there. And, and making his way in, but not as fast as I would prefer. Because it's not up to me. I can hope and wish the best. If I'm not praying, what am I doing? And so to be, to be generous, to recognize the progress that's made by people. And it's, it's hard sometimes for people not to be judgmental about those sitting next to them in the pews. They'd rather them to just leave. No, oh, that guy doesn't believe this this way. I see this guy acting this way in church. How dare he do that? That guy needs to get out of here. Saints don't think that way. People who should be reading more saints do. Saints don't treat those people that way. They bring them up and they recognize that rooting them out and pulling them out may end up harming even the wheat. Pulling the weeds could hurt the wheat. They recognize this. So let them grow side by side. Let the Lord be the reaper of these things. The threshing floor is coming. Why rush that? It's better they're there than not there. Because then you can be an influence. You are an influence. And I'm an influence if I am judgmental out of my mind about people. Constantly just bashing left and right because, and not, look, it's not saying don't confront sins that are sins, <clears throat> but even in that, you need to go and you need to talk to that person in a way that's actually going to be fruitful. Otherwise, it's not fraternal. You're not a brother going to connect with your brother and saying, I think there's something wrong. You're actually causing enormous amounts of problems. It's like, it's amazing that whole process. If you've got a problem with your brother, go to him. Go to him. Deal with that guy. And then if it doesn't work, extra, expand on that. Two or three witnesses, okay. It's pretty bad still. In that case, it's got a hierarchy, a chain of command that you go up. Of course, ending in the church, obviously. All right, the vicar, ultimately. And so you sit there and you say, if people then, nowadays, take a complaint against their brother and they splash it all over the internet, that's a little bit more than two or three people. And are you planning on bringing the people that randomly saw that? Are you planning on bringing them to the church? Or are you just winging it online? What are you doing? And Brian... Are you talking to Jeremiah as in the Kaiser? <laughs> Jeremiah's delusional? What are you smoking? I hope you're talking about some other Jeremiah. That'd be really a big bummer. 
I said, I, do I know you? Yeah. Yeah, use my, if, if you're, if apparently, dude, if you're really talking about me, dude, bring it, son. <laughs> do better than that. That's coward, that's cowardliness, bro. That's a <laughs> cowardliness. You can do better than that. I'm right here. It's it's easier though, backbiting, isn't it? Is that easier to backbite people? To snip and nip? Is that what that is? Probably easy. No, I don't need to fight you. What do you mean fight me, bro? <laughs> Dude, you you got there's some things going on. People should pray for this guy. There's obviously a lot going on there. There's obviously a lot happening. And it's unfortunate because it doesn't have to be that way. You can imagine we're back right again, I think. This is, a, an act, in fact, it's a good, it's a good, well, I know you're not hiding. You don't say my name. But we've, we've come into contact here with the fretful, irritable, passionate temper. And that's a good opportunity to practice forbearance and gentleness. Yeah. It's what it is. It's a good opportunity. I consider you a cross I bear. And I hope you don't mind that. And yeah, if you, and by the way, if anyone ever has issue, takes issue with something I say, I mean, saying delusional, I, you know, <laughs> there's like a, an actual kind of medical thing with that, right? Um, I don't know if I've displayed any of those things. So maybe that's just hyperbole on your part. I would probably say that's not the best thing to do when talking about people like that. Um, but that's just me. But I say, I have a chat. You're always welcome to go into the chat and actually speak with me, converse with me, and tell me all about how delusional I am. Sometimes people are right about criticisms. I've taken that. Ask people in the chat. The people have come in and said things about me where they're, they're correcting me on something or saying that I don't listen or whatever. I, I listened to one guy, man. He was in there. It was like an hour. You just don't, you'd be a monopoly on the mic. I gave it to him. And at the end, I said I was sorry. So back to Bernard, right? It was a result of the saint's own ardent zeal and great purity. So he was doing this really tough on people because of this, right? He was very tough because of his own zeal and his great purity that he had. And zeal is assuredly a virtue. So it's, he's saying, this is a good thing. It's not bad for St. Bernard. Yet, in this case, it became an evil. In, in other words, an otherwise good thing taken too far. Like slaying prelates with the sword of your word when you're a layperson. Speaking in a way that the church has emphatically said you cannot regarding your superiors. That's one. It's good to recognize a problem. It's another thing to take upon oneself judgments that do not belong to them and to go out and do so publicly without feeling a vehement sense of great shame, which is what uh, St. Gregory the Great said and Leo the Thirteenth, Magisterial. But God vouchsafed to correct it, filling St. Bernard's heart with gentleness, tenderness, and mildness. So that changing his whole system, he reproached himself bitterly with his former exacting severity and became so tender and forbearing that he was like St. Paul, all things to all men, that he might gain them all. What a powerful testimony, by the way. What a, what a powerful testimony. The idea of people with, with, with great zeal, otherwise good thing, otherwise good folks, and they take something simply too far. They just take something too far. And in taking something too far, they end up making it an evil. Be the person to show them that. Be the person to show them. Like showing people, you know, in the chat that say, don't use hyperbole. No one in this channel ever does that. That's bad kindergarten logic. My kids use that kind of logic in my house. I don't let them use that. Well, you know, but you did this. Or, but, you know, oh, the guy in front of me was driving... 15 over, I was only going 12. That kind of logic is, I would submit, not very good. It definitely doesn't warrant anything. If anything, 
It would simply warrant saying, I don't do that, but I don't think you should either. That's an easy way to to deal with people like what's talked about here. Or in fact, what's displaying itself in the chat. St. Jerome records of his beloved daughter in the faith, St. Paula, that she not only was extravagant in her bodily mortifications, but also self-willed in persisting in them contrary to the advice of St. Epiphanius. That was her bishop. And further, that at the death of those she loved, she indulged in such excessive grief as to endanger her own life. It'll be said, he continues, that instead of praising this holy woman, that I'm condemning her. But I call Jesus, her master and mine, to witness that I speak the whole truth, both good and bad, representing her as she really was, according as one Christian should write of another. That is to say, I write her memoir. Right? Yeah. And truly, her faults would be another's virtues. That is to say, the faults and imperfections of that saint would have counted as virtues in one less holy. And indeed, there are many actions which we hold as imperfections in the perfect, which in the imperfect would pass for great virtues. Yeah. We must esteem highly those who abound in virtues, even though mingled with imperfections, remembering that so in so it has been with saints. So you have to remember that these saints, and it's one of those things to recognize that those saints, there are things in their life that they struggled with too, right? They, they had to go to confession. They needed to cry out for God's grace. They went through hard times. They acted out in ways that they needed to say sorry for. And that's one of the things that made him a a saint, in fact. Our aim is to become good, devout, pious men and women. And to that end, we must labor. Then, if it should please God to give us angelic perfections, we should doubtless be good angels. But meanwhile, so in the meantime, when you are not a good angel... Let us simply, humbly, and devoutly practice those lowly virtues, the acquisition of which has been appointed by our Savior as our daily task, such as patience, cheerfulness, a mortified heart, humility, obedience, poverty, chastity, kindness toward our neighbor, forbearance toward toward our neighbor's faults, diligence, and holy fervor. Let us cheerfully leave preeminent graces to preeminent souls. We do not deserve so high a post in God's service. Too happy if we can obtain the humblest office in his household. And I love this is the end here. This is the end. Undoubtedly. High pretend, well, the idea that uh, everyday people Be an everyday person. Do not strive for something that is above your pay grade. There's no reason to do that. Follow the wisdom of St. Gregory the Great. We see this. One of the most common things in our world is seeing people who are constantly slaying prelates with the sword of their word, slaying their superiors. It's a false zeal, by the way. It's a false zeal. And in fact, it's just as bad, if not worse, according to the popes, as false prudence which is the, ah, I don't want to say nothing kind of thing. Because those people are indifferent. They appear to be. Whereas on the other side, those people, they struggle to accept anything that the church says without repugnance, without ill will, if they even assent to it at all. Flopping that monocle on 24-7, going through the ancient scrolls, acting like they got some magical negative charism that they don't have. And then going and judging everyone for not agreeing. And bashing everybody rather than praying. I challenge anybody who does that, who goes around bashing 24-7 on social media. Number one, they're not even familiar with ideas regarding dissent. They don't know. They, they're, they're cherry picking. What they do, they'll try to find any kind of example or instance, which is a situational ethic in order to make that excuse. But they don't have a normative ethic for it. Because the only normative ethic throughout the, the, the most normative is that we need to conform 
conform our thoughts, our words, and our deeds to the divine constitution of the visible church. Hierarchical. Different admonitions and directives for different different levels of that hierarchy. Different modes, different, different responsibilities. And the examples that were provided for us would be like King David being hunted down by King Saul, maniacal, wanting to kill him, lying about him left and right, hunting him down to die. And even then, he was afraid to cut the hem of the garment. And that's given as uh, St. Gregory the Great saying that this is, this is, in fact, the pious mind of everyday people. This is the, the inferior, not the superior, the inferior, the ordinary Johnny Q and Sally Sue. And that they need to recognize that even in doing that, that there was tremendous shame and, and, and uh, uh, penitence that David experienced even from doing that. And that if people make a habit of going around slaying prelates with the sword of their word, you, I, I have yet to meet anybody who spends nearly as much time encouraging people to pray for them. And much less that they do it themselves. They spend too much time on social media grandstanding to actually spend any time in their prayer closet. It's common. And it's an, it's an opportunity for us to do differently. To not be like that. To no longer do that. Trusting in the, the chariots and horsemen of our own minds. And the power of our super mega dope monocle. Nonsense. But these daily tasks, these lowly virtues that he appointed in fact for us. The glorious king does not reward his servants according to the dignity of their office but according to the humility and love with which they fulfill what's appointed to them. So Saul, for example, he was, he sought his father's donkeys and he found a kingdom in Israel. Rebecca, while watering Abraham's camels, became his son's bride. Ruth, gleaning after the reapers and lying at uh, Booz's feet, was raised up to be his wife. I put Booz in her boy. Undoubtedly, High pretensions, these ideas, these high pretensions, this is right, and again, Leo the 13th could have quoted this. Undoubtedly, high pretensions are very liable to illusions, deceits, and errors, so that sometimes those who would fain be angels are not really even good men. And there's more of elevation and holiness in their words and expressions than in their hearts and in their deeds. Nevertheless, we should never be hasty with our, with our contempt or censure. But while we thank God for the exalted favors that he bestows on others, that we remain humbly in our own lower sphere. Lower indeed, but safer, better, more suited to our weaknesses and insufficiency. Certain that if we walk therein humbly and faithfully, God will exalt us to real greatness. Yeah. All right. Make sure I'm going to go over right now. I'm going to go over to the chat. I'm going to have some fun over there for a minute. Not for super long. I hope you've enjoyed this, by the way. I hope you're having a good time. All right? And that you're learning. That you're taking these admonitions to heart. And the stories... And I'd love to hear stories that you've got to tell, right? I told you about things that happened in college, things that happened in my family, in my life with, with my daughter, my wife, things that are not necessarily the greatest in the world. It's not, it's not super awesome to be eating crow in front of a bunch of people. It's not awesome, but it's healthy. And I've come to find, you know, it's not too bad. It goes down with a lot of good graces, by the way. And it makes us better. It makes us better people, better husbands, better wives, better friends and family, sons and daughters, better parents, and better students, better, better at work, better at everything you do, better at just being a faithful Catholic. The Johnny Q and the Sally Sue sitting all kinds of frustrated in the Catholic pews. It makes us better. 
And it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to say, these are my weaknesses. This guy over here has got these weaknesses. You know, I can pray for that guy. I can go and talk to him privately. There are things that I can do. But going around and slaying people with the sword of my word, that's not very helpful. It's not productive at all. Instead, to do things fraternally, to say, I genuinely don't want you to be in any trouble, and I want you to help me too. Because at the end of the day, we're shipmates. We're shipmates on the bark of Peter. There may be times where you're hanging overboard or I'm hanging overboard, and we got to reach out for each other. We do that at the Wolfpack Chat. Link in the description below. Till next time. Never give up, keep on smiling, and memento mori. I wanted to make people dream bigger thoughts.